Hi, I'm Jane Kim, a deputy editor at The Atlantic. Welcome to The Atlantic Reads, an exploration of all things literature and books. I want to welcome Caitlin Flanagan, a staff writer with The Atlantic, to discuss the legacy of the late American essayist Joan Didion, which, Caitlin, you tackled beautifully in this um, month's cover story. Thank you for being with us. Oh, thank you. I'm always up to talk about Joan Didion. <laughs> always. Uh, let's jump right in. Okay. Um, so the, the piece is beautifully written and beautifully structured. Um, congratulations. Um, thank you. I was curious, what prompted you to want to do this kind of literary pilgrimage in the first place, um, sort of retracing Didion's steps through the various houses that she lived in? Well, you know, I'd known how ill Didion was. I'd known that she had Parkinson's. It was not a secret in any way. And there was a lot of news and hubbub about it around four years ago, but then she got through whatever health crisis was making it so, so disgust at the time. And for some magical thinking reason, I sort of thought, well, she's, she's beaten that. She's not going to die from that. Um, and then when I started getting all this news that she's very, very sick and it's really close to the end, I just, um, I felt really sorrowful. I felt brokenhearted. I felt as though I wasn't sure what to do with myself a bit. Um, my memories of her, of reading her and of a, a little bit having sort of contact with her when I was 14 in 1975, they were such big influences on me. And I always thought of her, even though she's so much older than, or was so much older than I am uh, at the time, uh, I guess she stops aging now, but um, I I just couldn't, she always seemed young to me. Even when you'd see her and she was so, you know, she was getting elderly, she was always so physically frail um, that that she kind of aged in some ways, even faster than her disease might have. But I still saw her as this girl in the gorgeous Julian Wasser photographs and in that inc those incredible essays and that incredible just, sense of herself and I just didn't know what to physically do with myself I wanted to stop her from dying and there can't do that and you certainly yeah. can't do it when you're just a reader you know that's doubly you can't do it but I just thought you know Joan Didion loved houses she loved keeping house she loved um she loved entertaining in a certain way she um Someone asked her once, well, why don't you ever have your husband help you with all this cooking? And she said, oh, I can't stand the idea of someone else being in my pantry or organizing my pantry. She was just a super competent person. And what she loved was having her linens organized and having her treasures organized and having these parties and making for these two extremely difficult people, her husband and her daughter, um, although she herself was difficult, it was just a household of difficult people. But really what kept them all together in large part home in a very kind of, well, she was a creature of the 50s. So she was simultaneously a creature of the 60s with her Corvette and all of this. But she had some ideas that I guess were older than conventional um, sort of feminine house homemaking ideals of the 50s. They were more sort of um, these kind of elegant and in many ways self-created systems and I just thought, maybe if I can go to the houses she created or lived in, in California, maybe I'll get some kind of sense of her. And in a way, in some places I did and in others I didn't. Mm. That's lovely. It's, it's interesting. There's like a tradition of doing this kind of, of trip, right? Like based on where a writer lived or traveled to or, or worked. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think of the sort of smaller versions of this, like visiting a bar where like a poet frequented or, you know, bigger versions of it, too, like what you did with just kind of tracing, you know, enti an entire period of, of a writer's life um, geographically. Um, do you think there's a certain kind of writer that that makes a lot of sense to do this for um, that, that works That's particularly well? I think it more has to do with the reader. You know, there's that famous thing where to, um I was going to say it was um, Lionel Trilling, but it was in conversation with Lionel Trilling when Nabokov said that there's the most, the half of the experience of reading is you have the artist reader and that person is creating this work of art as much as the piece of paper with the words on it. And mm -hmm. I think, um, you can get into a lot of literary theory on this, but we won't, 
But I think there are just some writers that we feel this extraordinary connection to. And, and we want to be there. We want to be close to them in some way. And it's often helpful if they're dead because a lot of times, you know, when we meet writers that we really love, a lot of times they're really dull. I mean, I'm sure I'm super disappointing. Anybody who's read my work and they met me, I was like, um, I just a little bit of an introvert. Never. I don't know what to say. Um, I get really caught up in hyper politeness and maybe they want to see the person who's very funny on the page and I, I tend not to do that or be that. But so I, th I think it really has to do with, with your own connection. You know, it's not that, oh, I've got to go to Harry's bar in Venice. You know, well, that's just going to be wonderful, even if you don't care about Hemingway. But it's like if there's some writer and you're just like, for whatever reason, this writer, it's not just a writer, it's not just a book, it's so much more. It's almost like we have these cells in our bodies that bind with the work, or molecules, I guess, that bind with the work of certain writers until they really become our own. And I think in that case, it's almost like you're looking at the home of a, of a relative or an ancestor you never met. There's, it's almost like it can't be disappointing unless, you get there, you can be a very grand place and maybe you don't get the feeling at all of, of, of their being there. And then it can be a very modest place. They live briefly and you can really feel it. So right. it's a good question. I think it's always, if any, and I, it's very in me, Jane. You know, when I started dating my husband, he was, his family's from Minneapolis. And I was like, well, of course, well, the first time I went, well, of course, so, so should we spend the second day going to all of Fitzgerald's houses? And he's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like, we well, might go to the lake, you know, we could go to at the museum. And I was like, what do you mean he's never been to all of it? And my father was a writer and a historian. So I really grew up doing that. And just right. any way you can get close, if you really love a writer, I think it's worthwhile. Right. Oh, that's lovely. Um, I, if I could just ask you about the nuts and bolts of your tricks. Um, I'm really curious how you planned it out. I'm like immediately thinking of the expense report that I still haven't submitted. That's the first thing. Like, Don't talk to me about the expense report. I can't figure out. Okay, go. <laughs> no, no, no. But you, you uh, mentioned in your in your essay, you know, at some point, googling was it the the, the Sacramento house that you googled at some point? Like, I'm curious. Like, did you just research one at a time? Did you like kind of just take it? Yeah, one at a time. Go uh, like research. Go come back sort of compile your thoughts and then kind of move on to the next place? Or, or was it a little bit more, um, you know, involved and interconnected than that? It all was very organic in that because I, again, like I was 14 and 19, so I always say like, I was moody teenager A of the Joan Didion experience. Because when I met her, she hadn't even read the White Album. And right. I was like the 1975 version of every college girl who has her picture in the dorm. But I, I really don't, I can't imagine. She was really known, but in a, a cult way around um, in certain circles, very hip, very fashionable circles. She was not a widely read person. Um, so anyways, I learned so much about her. I inhabited her in so many ways that when the internet came along, it didn't even occur to me well, why don't I look up where she lived? Why don't I see if I can find the house? It just didn't occur to me. And then I thought, well, even as I typed it in, well, I, well, her house in Sacramento, and you know, there's always that split second when you click on a link and you're like, I probably shouldn't have done this, you know? <laughs> and um, usually it's some hideous, you know, revolting thing, but I just felt very intrusive. And I was mm -hmm. like, wow, there's her house. One of the houses she lived in Sacramento when she was in high school. And boy, it's a lot grander than I imagined. And um, which I had a lot to do with my really misreading her early politics and that she came from this wealthy right. family, you know, relatively speaking for Sacramento at the time. And I thought, wow, that's really challenging. And so we, and then the ha famous house on Franklin, I know you're a Los Angelino. So I, I came to LA in 88 and I would cross Franklin every single day never occurred to me to look for that famous house she lived in because she says at the end of the essay about it that it was slated to be demolished um, right. because of new zoning and then so I said what so then I I found the first house and then I was reading Tracy Donahue's biography which anybody who wants to know lots and lots and lots about Diddy and that very carefully researched he had the addresses of all the houses 
and so many of them were here in LA, you know. And so I started, I went to Sacramento, which is just, if you love Joan Didion and you love those early essays, go to Sacramento because you'll see the two governor's houses that she mm. describes in many mansions. Um, you'll see there's a, um, her, her very uh, disliked step-grandmother Genevieve Didion was a real power player in Sacramento. So that's like, a, there's, a, there's a Didion middle school, but it's not Joan, it's Genevieve. And she <laughs> like set up all these gardens. So you'll see all that. You'll see, you know, in the old governor's mansion where she was um, initiated into this kind of fancy girl sorority called the Manana Club. And it's almost as though in that older section of the city, you know everywhere. It's a very dreamlike experience. And then the final one was just taking this drive out to Malibu. And I, I, I when I finally got to Malibu, I just felt like, okay, I can let go of Joan Didion. She's probably, she's probably glad to hear it. But I felt like for the first time in my life, okay, she's now a writer in the past. She's no longer mm -hmm. a living person in my oh. sense of writers. You know, um, I'm hearing you talk about Sacramento and also reading about it um, uh, in in your essay. Like, it, it, it's true. Like, I, I I was so drawn to the way you describe your reaction to the house, the the Sacramento one. Um, how you hadn't realized how wealthy they were and um, her family, and and it it made me think a little bit like maybe you could talk a little bit about how Gideon related to Sacramento as a writer. I mean, she, mm. you know, clearly Sacramento is important to her origin story. Um, and, you know, there's a quality in her writing that people talk about so much. And, you know, one of the reasons why um, her writing is meaningful for a lot of her, her fans, um, you know, this, this ability to be both very specific and, and evocative of a particular place, and then somehow also personal and intimate for a reader, like regardless of where they're from. And I wondered, like, do you, how is it, do you think, that being from um, nowhere, California, as I think you put it in your essay, influenced the way she wrote about place, do you think? Mm. Well, that's a really good question. What influenced her so much is that she loved that land so much. It's a politically complicated issue because of how California land was taken and was redistributed and it's it's a touchy area. She yeah. wasn't an, she did not at all explore that, those aspects of it. But um, she, what I hadn't known and found out and sort of talking to people and family members is that her father, I knew that her father gambled. I knew that he was like a gambler. And I know that there's a lot of gambling in her work, especially played as it lays and this kind of figure that's reminiscent of her father, I think. But I just thought he played the tables and when they, when they were short some money, he, he would often go and play and gamble. But it turns out his biggest gamble was he was an incredible speculator of real estate. And he would buy these pieces and he somehow, because he was a generationally old Californian and Sacramento, in fact, he made these, he bought a big piece of land next to what's now Stag Leap's Vineyards in Napa, which is, you know, just so incredibly valuable. He right. bought all this land and he would sell it and make prof wild profits because, you know, California land, once you get, if you hold on to it, certainly to the 70s, if you've had it that long, you were going to make a huge profit. And Joan Didion's brother is, uh, who died uh, about a year before she did, I think maybe that's a lot of why she finally let go. Um, not that you can pick the day and hour of your death, but I think sometimes some lingering diseases, there's a sense of that. Um, he was a major, major developer, real estate developer of, of, in California. And um, he ran a $1 billion real estate development company. And so there's this sense of the Didians as simultaneously these people who loved California. They loved the, the rivers, you know, the American river and the Russian river and how cold they would run in the winter and how wonderful they were to swim in in the summer. And um, the look of the ranch land, they loved that, but they were also destroying California because they were turning a lot of it into, you know, as I write in the piece, there's a like, Joan did the industry hated nothing more than fast food. What a blight it was. Well, she and her brother sold a beautiful piece of ranch land and there's a McDonald's on it, right? In Sacramento. So it's really, um, but she has this great line that 
the land belongs to the person who thinks about it most obsessively, who remembers it most clearly, who returns to it most often. And that's one of her magic tricks. Like, well, it's also oh, it belongs to the person who has the deeds on all this land. <laughs> but, um, right. but it always struck me because that's how my father was with Ireland. We didn't own any property in Ireland, but nobody could own Ireland more than Thomas Flanagan. He just loved it. It was, and I, and I think for Didion, it, it is that specificity. And she had such pride in her family, things that nowadays we would say, oh, that's not something to be proud of, you know, that your parents are literally settler, not literally, but almost settler colonial, colonialist, right, you know, right, right. Um, colonist. But um, she just loved all these generations of hers that had been in this piece of land. And there's just a beautiful memory in, I think it's in the book where I was from about watching her, her brother run a bulldog of his over land that had been in her family for generations. And there's something very, this is the, this is the kind of the magic trick, even though we can stand outside and say, well, isn't that nice for you to have all this land when we know there was a, the California genocide was a lot was very much took part as well in Sacramento that that tribes are lost through it um but on the other hand I think especially in our culture now we're so transient the idea of not just a person but a family being deeply seated in a, in a land and of returning to something and having it always be there I think we're always as people going to be very very drawn to that it's an appealing notion yeah no I think that's right it's such a complicated idea as you say and, and I was so glad that in your piece, you wrote about um, Gideon's essay, um, Notes from a Native Daughter, which, uh, you know, such provocative title too, right? Um, yeah. And and it's, whenever I've read that essay, like I've always wondered how much she was kind of aware of the myths that she herself was sort of deploying and sort of, um, you know, kind of making herself a part of in some sense and, and creating her own versions of. Um, mm -hmm. do, you, do you think, how, how aware, sort of how self-aware do you think she was on that front? versus kind of, you know, it, it being, you know, from it being something that like, we just weren't thinking about in quite the same way back then. Because it, it, does, it does seem like there's some hints of that kind of awareness in that essay. Um, you know, she, she, she sort of does have a little bit of that, like, you know, the, the focus on myths and, and right. that myths are something that we kind of need um, mm -hmm. and, and, and the power of that. I'm curious what you think. Mm-hmm. Well, it's interesting. In those early years, I don't think she had any awareness at all <laughs> of, I mean, but, but whatever notions, I think she thought of myth-making, that it was part of the things that families do and that land does and that you, it wasn't until decades later when she wrote Where I Was From that she began to right. finally understand that everything she thought was so permanent and eternal was just and that you know she'd always thought she's such a republican when she was young and, and her whole ethos was that we don't need the government and you know the american person working on his or her own will create the thing and self-reliance and then she realized that without the railroads boringly enough <laughs> that were funded by the federal government california would never have been able to enter the world of commerce in such a large way so it wasn't self-made by these white families um, I don't think, but I think she was definitely, but I think what she was very canny about, and one thing I would tell every young writer is that if there is no place that's too obscure, it is a bug. What do you call it? It's a, what's the opposite of a bug? Feature. <laughs> feature not a bug. It's a feature, not a bug, because there's often a sense that, well, if you're from New York or you're from some fabulous, you're from Paris, of course, you're going to feature that. That just adds to your cool. And I mean, I'm dropping that in from Berkeley every other sec sentence when I write because I'm so square. <laughs> yeah, but I grew up really a cool place. Um, but Sacramento, there's nothing, I, I don't know. Obviously when she was young, she thought it was the center of the earth. You know, like she went to San Francisco to shop with her mother, but you know, her family were super prominent. They knew governors, they knew all these people. And um and so I'm sure when she was young, she loved it. And the big cleaving for her was that, and, and I've got to get someone at the Atlantic to, to get the rights to run this at college season next year. She, all her, 
everything she wanted about life was she was going to be from Sacramento. She was going to be in the dancing class. She was going to be in the Manana club. And she was going to go to Stanford. And even when I was young, Grogan Berkeley, Stanford was like, who would go there? It was just like for some rich kid, you know, so oh, they're playing their sports. But I mean, I really remember my dad was a professor at Berkeley and someone from the department left to go to Stanford. And everyone was like, why would he do that? Like, what's happened to <laughs> Phil, you know? And then Phil came to a sentence and he came back two years later. It was, it was just about, it was where rich people went and you knew everybody and you were in the same clubs and you wore the same clothes and whatever. And she, all her friends got in and she didn't get in. And she was devastated, absolutely devastated. Not for the modern reason of, oh, I'll, you know, I'll never get my, you know, startup incubator going if I can't get to Palo Alto. <laughs> it was more like, well, this is where the nice, pretty girls from the wealthy families go. And here's the real kicker. She didn't get in because she didn't have the grades. It's like she was, a, <laughs> her parents cared nothing about where you went to college or your grades. They were very much about, you know, live your life. Like, and her mother would have really cared if she wore the wrong dress, I think, somewhere. But right. she did right. not care about that. And she's like, get, get over yourself. She did not have the, enough credit to go to Berkeley. Anybody could go to Berkeley at that time. You're Californian. She didn't have the credits. And she had to go. Her, her brother would have to go to community college. But she had to, I think, two of the credits she did pick up at community college because there were some required classes. So to get to go to Berkeley, she had to do this. And she was so crushed by that. And, but I think that experience saved her. I think she would have been a very provincial person at Stanford. And I think yeah. she got to Berkeley and she was with these great, the Stanford English department was genuinely not special, let's put it that way, in the 50s. And the Berkeley yeah. English department was already becoming the greatest department in the country. And uh, I think that changed her. But so back to being from a, like an obscure place, even when she got to New York, she was starting to write some essays, criticism for like the different magazines. And in one of the pieces, she said, oh, people like this think, you know, people out here and people in New York feel this way about this work of art. And then she says at the second sentence of the thing, I myself am from Sacramento and I don't feel that way. And I thought, okay, that's knowing. You know, you don't, <laughs> you know, she's been in New York. Like, she's not like, I myself am from Sacramento, you know. She knows that she's throwing down a card of, um, of kind of contempt for super elite New York, Manhattan, whatever. Even though she adored it, was at the center, would become at the center of it. She sort of used that's the thing. If I could tell in my small way anything to a writer that I've learned, all the messy, embarrassing parts of your story that you'd like to kind of kind of color correct and airbrush and edit them out. That is the story. And the right. more you put that in, even if you're writing criticism that you never once mentioned yourself, the more you accept that you're not just the polished version that you think you're creating or uh, telling people, the more you just the whole thing, and then we get into this, I think younger writers, certainly my younger writers in like around 2000 or so, young women felt, oh, okay, I get it. The thing to do is to tell just all oh, my most hideous, revolting things about myself. It's not so much that, it's just that you don't need to do that. It's, it's just to really, the more you can sit in who you truly are. Like if you're from Sacramento, I myself am from Sacramento. I mean, it's almost she threw a gauntlet down by saying that because here she is, she's writing something, that essay, smarter than anything you would read in that magazine for a year. But she's saying, I'm from Sacramento. Like, yeah, I, I got something that you guys don't have. And I'm going to use that against you in a way in my writing. So I, I think it was brilliant. So anyways, wherever you're from, yeah, yeah. if it's a weird place, like if you're from Pismo <laughs> Beach, that needs to be in every single essay for your first five years. <laughs> Well, it's so interesting. You actually led right into a question I was going to ask about. Um, uh, you, you quote uh, Mark Shore, um, who taught Didion and, and um, whom you, you knew uh, growing up. Um, and I was struck by that line um, that he, he says that he, or said that he found in Didion's early work, not only evidence of a great writer, but a great performer. And it strikes me that, you know, the line that you just mentioned about her saying, I myself am from uh, Sacramento, like might be like, Part, part of that, like her ability to 
hide certain things and show other things, mm -hmm. put certain things forward, maybe um, take, keep other things sort of to herself. Would you, would you agree? It's so interesting because as a kid, Mark Shore was a member of English, he was older than my dad. And he was kind of a father figure in a way to my own father. And his wife, Ruth, they were just amazing, elegant people. Um, but Mark Shore and Joan Didion are like a love match complete in that Mark, you know, here in Berkeley, like, you know, at the hippie revolution, he had this um, dark blue MG sports car and he would roar up and down the hills. He was always really well dressed. His wife was beautiful. And his daughter, Suki Shore, became a major ballerina, it was in um, Balanchine's company. And oh, wow. um, was at one time, I think, prima ballerina um, for George Balanchine. And so there was a sense that Mark, I mean, we would talk about it with a child, a teenager. When Mark and Ruth showed up for a faculty dinner party, you can imagine like a uh, Berkeley faculty dinner party. They were dressed. They looked fantastic. They would always bring their own bottle of vodka because Mark usually had to drink up like 10 martinis. And um, they arrived places. They, were, they weren't your normal, you know, Berkeley, like I got my Birkenstocks on at all. He was really attuned to performance. And Joan, you know, who'd, you know, she'd studied ballet just as a girl. And she'd, she just had a sense of herself, always, always had a sense of herself as a very exquisite, beautiful, particular person. And that she, there were plenty of times when she'd be somewhere and she'd be, she was one of those people, one of those women who can be the most forgettable person of all and just dress down. And there are other times when she could really make an effect or an impact that she wanted to. And her writing was a constant performance because every other essay you'll think, but wait, wow, she revealed all that. But wait a minute, what is this thing? What, what, why is she at this bar? at 10 o'clock in the morning and not wanting to go back to New York and there's a, a rip in her hand, what's going on? Well, you reread it all these years later and you realize she's the one who's having the affair with the guy, not Estelle at the end of the bar um, or also. So she just lets out enough to tantalize us. It's given birth to some of the worst writing, Jane. Oh, when you go to like <laughs> Vanity Fair or like, it's re really guilty women my age. And it even down to like the forties, it's like, well, I was, they kind of like pump up some grand thing. Like, you know, I was that, I was the day of the Met Gala. I certainly wouldn't have gone to the Met Gala on that particular day. Lady, you're not invited to the, like, that's fine that you wouldn't go because <laughs> you were not invited to the Met Gala. You know, it's this way, this bad writing. And I used to do it when I was like, oh, it's so fancy. I have just all these fancy things that I'll just drop in. Better you don't know more about it. Um, but she did that. She created, she's a real seductress on the page. She's apparently real seductress in life in a lot of ways, but mm -hmm. she was a real seductress on the page. And people, people read Joan Didion, the early work, and they fall in love with her. They really, like I asked yeah. her biographer and I, I who'd never met her. And I, I said, when you were writing this, did you fall a little bit in love with Joan Didion? And he kind of looked at me and then he was like, yeah, <laughs> it's just, there's something about her that, and that's why I love writing. All, she's, she's not even alive anymore. And you can read those essays and fall in love with that person. Right, right. Well, and I mean, the ability to sort of show us certain things and not others. I mean, there's, a, there's that darker side too. Um, I wanted to move on to Gideon's LA house, that, that period of Franklin Avenue house. Um, and if I, if I might, I just wanted to read a couple of lines from your, your essay, which I thought were so interesting. Oh, I, can, I can't it. bear it, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> Only for the Atlantic, <laughs> I will allow it. <laughs> um, so this is what you write about that, that particular period. Um, this is the Joan Didion who invented Los Angeles in the 60s as an expression of paranoia, danger, drugs, and the movie business. The Joan Didion who took amphetamines to work and bourbon to relax. The tiny girl who was entirely in command of the helpless artist she inspired. I love that last line, but as you write, in reality, it was also one of the hardest times of her life, um, which leads me to sort of ask you about the details you include on her marriage to John Gregory Dunn and, and you know, his anger, his temper that you write about, that sort of, that passing reference to kicked down doors, um, which kind of stunned me into sort of rereading some of those, um, those passages, but um, how do those details and, and 
Dunn's kind of outsized presence in her life affect the way that you see her and her work? You know, because of the year of magical thinking, there's an impression that this was a marvelous and perfect marriage. It was certainly a unique marriage, certainly times of profound closeness and interconnectedness, profound. Um, but I'd pass the gauntlet now to younger feminists to really work on this issue because I think she was an abused wife. I do. And what we're talking about now is there's an essay in the White Album where we everybody remembers this essay. If you've ever read this essay, you remember it. She's describing that she she loved the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. My highest journalistic achievement in my whole life was getting the New Yorker to send me to the Royal Hawaiian Hotel for a week. That was like, I'll never top that one. Um, speaking of expense reports, this other one is just nickels and dimes. I just can't get it together. But um, she wrote a lot about the Royal Hawaiian Hotel and the tall ceilinged rooms and the windows open to the trade winds and all this. And so she opens this piece saying, I'm here with my husband and the baby, which she often called the toddler baby. And there's, you know, frangipani lays and there's trade winds in the palms and whatever. And um, we have come here, my husband and I, in lieu of filing for divorce. And everybody, the first time you read that, if you don't know what's coming, I so remember lying in my, my, my bed at my parents' house, home from college, first year of college, middle of the night, and you see a line like that. And um, you, and there's no Google. You can't be like, did they get a divorce? What's going on? You're just left with that line. And then she kind of talks how, she says how they keep it together during the week and they mend things up. And there's no talks about hospitalized psychotics, you know, things that Joan has obviously done or about kicked down doors. So when, so 40 years later, she writes The Year of Magical Thinking about John. And one of the first questions everybody asked was, well, what about, did she talk about the, the time that they went there in lieu of filing for divorce? And jo Joan says, yes. Did he know I was gonna write that essay? He edited that essay, that she wrote the first draft. He took Quintana to the zoo in Honolulu, came back, edited it, and she did the next draft. And I wanna say, I think that, so let alone the fact that I think he was he was obviously an alcoholic. He was one of the meanest drunks around, legendarily so. His male friends, after he died, would explain it as though it was kind of a, a foible, you know, a, a little, you know, ethnic charm. Oh, the Irish, you know. Here's this woman. She weighs like 95 pounds a lot of her life. And he's a big kind of burly Irish alcoholic. And... Um, Everyone says it's their right. It's so great the way he ed they edited each other's work. I would love to see the first draft of that essay before he changed it. I think that he talked about a limiting full. Her main great work is personal, and her husband, who was wildly jealous, no matter what party line there is. Oh, envy, never a moment. You know, he's kind of a nobody. I mean, he was a good writer, but nobody. I've read all his essays. I can hardly remember any of them. Um, except there was one very good one about um, Okinawa. But um, she was the great writer. She's the major figure of that, you know, the second half of the 20th century. She's on any list of the top 10 great American writers. On many lists, she's near, she is the top. And this guy, this jealous alcoholic semi-failure guy, is editing every word she writes. I would have loved to see all those essays before he got his hands on them. Because uh -huh. her boyfriend before him, Noel Parmentel, um, he too, she just always revered him and his taste, literary taste, and he edited her work. And I, and I think that he um, edited it for the better in terms of what we the reader got to, to see of Joan. But John had his demons. And uh, I don't know if they ended it just, but the minute a man is kicked, it, it just shows. Granted, it was the time. I hope we wouldn't yeah. still do this today. That if a woman, you know, tall, small, whatever, if 
But if a woman tells you the fight was so bad that I locked a door against him and he kicked it down, and you just think how terrifying that would be. Um, but it was sort of read at the time. She's put it, said it in a certain way, Hawaii, the flowers, the lays, all of that, that we kind of um, just, it almost read as like a mark of passion, which is the terrible, terrible way to ever think of abuse, women's abuse. So I, I would like younger writers to really explore that relationship. And there's a lot of people who were alive who knew that dynamic well, and some aren't ready to talk about it, you know, but I think it should be examined. Do you think that um, we, we readers, we fans, you know, like, do you think that we romanticize that period so readily because of the way she wrote about that period? Do you, or do you, I guess I'm curious if you think that the sort of ha like highly edited version of her life that appeared in those pages, um, if that was her in some ways protecting herself, maybe that was also, as you say, John's presence. Um, uh, but do you, do you think that it's what we were given or, or, or the way that we were reading it that allowed us also sort of to be, uh, not to use an overused word, but complicit sort of in, in, mm -hmm. in that story? Um, that is a good word, I think. That's a good word um, for that. I just, th I'll tell you, you know, out, outside of what she explicitly said, she was in the, John Gregory Dunn was ever a great like storyteller or whatever. He knew everybody, he loved inviting people over. And when you read the list of people who would just casually be at their parties from major yeah. Uh, California painters, artists, musicians, Janis Joplin shows that up from, you know, she just finished a gig at the Hollywood Bowl. Um, I mean, Warren Beatty was in love with Joan Diddy and there, you know, just all these major actors, major directors. And, and the house was just, is still, have you been out to the house? Next time you're in LA, let's go to the house. Let's please, um, yeah. It's it's right by Runyon Canyon, just across from Runyon Canyon. And it's pretty close to where I grew up. I, but it, uh, again, it was sort of different worlds. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, because you know, and I lived in Hancock Park my first four years in LA, and so I was always driving past that. But I was like, oh, it's not there anymore. Um, but she was just—I can't believe there hasn't been a biopic yet. I shouldn't say that; some horrible thing will instantly be written, um, probably by me. Um, stop me before I biopic again. Um, never biopic I won't biopic but <laughs> she's just this cool creature because she was this incredible cook she threw these huge parties she was very careful served this incredible food one time Nora Ephron really pissed her off because Nora's like I want that chicken recipe and John's like oh. and Nora's like no I want the chicken recipe um and she got it out of her and and then by so she's throwing these huge parties by day, she's getting in her car and going to San Bernardino to follow a famous murder trial or going up to Santa Barbara to follow this kind of um, dopey think tank that was being being founded there. Um, she's, she's everywhere and she's, people tell me to this day, she explained California to them. No, she created an idea. How can you write about Los Angeles obsessively and never mention a black person. Right, right. It's just, you know, yeah, she did, yeah. um, she interviewed up in Northern California. She interviewed Huey Newton and I think Eldridge Cleaver at one point. And those essays aren't, I mean, you, you can't, you cannot have interviewed Huey Newton and not just seen this incredible intelligent, I mean, hugely intelligent, charismatic person, but, other than those figures very much of them called forward in the moment, you know, she just was, she was just recording it and not really thinking about it that much, I think. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting way of putting it. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the Malibu um, 
uh, house period era too, um, you write so beautifully about uh, an orchid nursery that she visited um, and the sort of the way that she had a kind of relationship with the man who ran it, and who would, you know, sort of let her be and seem to understand that she needed something from being among these flowers, which seemed to sort of almost reflect on the way that she herself was. Um, mm-hmm. And I just, I, I love that scene that you, that you draw when you visit that nursery and, you know, it's still around. Um, and like seeing her through the eyes of the orchid growers um, and sort of through that lens, uh, was really powerful and, and in some ways made her feel like more alive to me in memory, at least than, than she did in, 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 in like other areas and other spots. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about that particular mm-hmm. trip. Well, um, this was another thing like that. So she told me about the Franklin Avenue house that it had been, was going to be destroyed shortly after she finished writing to be turned into apartments. And there's lots of, I know that stretch of Franklin, there's lots of really crummy apartment buildings where there were obviously once great 20s houses. Yeah. The block, the zoning end at the exact block where her house was. So it's still there. And then about this wonderful, just incredible essay about, it's a final essay in the White Album. It's kind of about when the fever broke, all the problems that she'd been having emotionally and psychologically she moves out to Malibu and there's an orchid nursery and this was in the days I did a whole like I really went to school on orchid growing because it's such an interesting topic because now we get them at Ralph's for like what (laughs) $4.99 they're everywhere right and it's hard to remember like there was a time like oh if somebody had an orchid you know wow that was like a very rich person might have orchids or like a super old lady would have like this tiny little greenhouse window and have her orchid. But because now we just clone them. They, they come mostly from Taiwan actually. And they come over here in a particular stage and then they get to the States and they get flash frozen for some reason, which forces them. It's just totally unwonderful and unbeautiful process. By, and that's why they look exactly the same. You'll go to like Trader Joe's and they're all exactly the same. They're big white moth orchids. But in those days, people were propagating them by hand and h- making hybrids. And, and she said she'd always loved a greenhouse and she'd always been thrown out of greenhouses when she was little. But she, right across PCH, you know, in the canyon, there was this orchid nursery. And she didn't even know in the beginning that this is one of the main orchid nurseries in the world and that these were not flowers you just bought for a few dollars. These were sold for $10,000, $100,000. And there was this very gently, she describes it in words that I thought, I wonder if you would use words like that anymore. But she described him, he was Mexican, as having a kind of a courtliness and otherness, um, which I can totally imagine. You know, I know men like that, Mexican men like that, who are, you know, so it's, it's sort of like, oh, that she's using a stereotype. And it's like, well, I do know men like that. And they developed, the perfect kind of relationship for her. It's that they were both there at the same time. She could just be there for an hour. She just loved the quality of the light, the humidity, all of these orchid blossoms trembling in the gentle air that might come in when the door opened. Just a a totally um, incredible space. And then the day after they left Malibu to go to stupid Brentwood Park, I did not follow them to Brentwood Park beginning at the end. nothing interesting has ever happened in Brentwood Park. Um, I mean, I mean, like what? I don't know. It's just pursuits, isn't it really? Um, uh, but to- of course, whatever. So in the end, the, the whole thing burns down. And it's right when Amado has finally saved up enough money. He just bought it and the whole thing burns down with all the orchids in it. And and I thought, oh, isn't that terrible? I've always, all my life, I've just loved reading the part of the essay where she's looking at the orchids and just the idea of being in a space with someone just companionably where you don't have to talk, you don't have to perform in any way. And that every time he, she left, he would give him, he would give her some orchids. Um, and that then it burned down, it was destroyed in the, the big, huge 70s Malibu fire when like, you know, birds were exploding in the air and the horses were, were, were racing, people were waiting on the beach to be rescued and then I found out wait a minute he rebuilt it it's still there so this was what was so dreamlike to me Jane it's like wait a minute 
It's like the, you've been wearing the ruby slippers all along. Like, Wait a minute, that the Franklin house is still there. It's like three minutes away, you know, nine minutes away from where I used to live. I pass it anytime I go to Running Canyon. And then wait a minute, the Malibu orchids, they rebuilt the nursery. And, you know, we just drove up, we went up a canyon road and I just felt like I was in a dream. Mm -hmm. And I, I just stepped in there and saw these incredible orchids. And, um, and the man who, who runs it now um, was trained by Amato, knew him well. And he sort of said, what, what brings you here? And I said, well, there's a writer called Joan Didion. He said, ah, oh, Joan Didion, you know? And I just felt, just was incredible. And then we drove out, there's a, um, usually if I'm going for some fried fish in Malibu, I'll just go to the real inn because I don't want to drive very far. But she was in Trancas, she was all the way, almost all the way up to the Ventura County line. And just beyond the Ventura County line, there's a place called Neptune's Net, which is a wonderful outdoor, has some indoor space, place where you can get some fish and feel the, the, the you know ocean air people on motorcycles are always pouring in and so if I can give our readers our listeners one the gift it would be like if you love Joan Didion's take a Joan Didion day go to her house in LA proper go to her house in Malibu buy some orchids and um oh here's a really sad thing I heard when she died lots of her close friends who really knew her sent orchids from that orchid nursery. But by the time they got to New York, they were all dead. Mm. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> um, I wonder if maybe we could, um, I can I can ask you a couple of the questions that came in through, um, like over email, some listener questions. Oh, reader, um, mail, that, reader mail, oh, reader mail. Reader mail, that's right. <laughs> um, here's one, what was, the one question that you still have that you didn't have the opportunity to ask Ms. Didion. Where did it come from? Where did that talent, that voice, there's just nothing in her family, her background, anything, this assurance that from 15 years old, before even, but that she knew she had something it was extremely special. It would be hugely regarded and valued. And that, that, that her destiny was to have this writing. I just wonder where did it come from? And the second thing is, um, I heard a lot of things that people wouldn't put on the record and I'd love to ask her, <laughs> like, is that true? Did she have an affair with that guy? <laughs> Who knows? But um, you know, when you write a piece like that, you 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 people tell you these stories and you're, and you're like that's off the they're like that's off the record I'm like yeah and in a way it was even better because it was sort of like oh now I'm in to the secret you know right of this right. you know that's great that's that's a great answer um let's see here's another one would Didion have said that she had recovered from the deaths of um her husband um and her daughter, Quintana, um, and how would she have characterized the impact of their death on her writing? Well, back to John, D John Gregory Dunn is not a great editor. Her first great book in 40 damn years was when he was dead <laughs> and he wasn't the one book he didn't edit <laughs> at all. Um, <laughs> but she, you know, Joan Didion is different. She's just, she is, a little bit, she's a little bit on the spectrum. Like she would tell us all the time, I don't have the normal reactions to things. And we'd be like, oh, that's an elegant thing to say. But we didn't believe her. But I talked to a woman and I know a poet who knew Didion, not well, but knew her, they were the same age. And uh, she said that when Joan went to clean out her daughter Quintana's apartment in New York after this disastrous, tragic death, that she was totally calm, dry eyed, organized everything, whatever, whatever. And then she was in Quintana's bedroom. She pulled out a drawer and she found the collar of a dog, a an old family dog that they had all loved. And that's when she burst into tears. Mm -hmm. And um, she, no, she didn't recover. She wouldn't, I mean, the thing about grief is 
the future depends on us letting go of our grief and moving forward without the person. Um, but there are some griefs that people, and we always think it's terrible if someone's stuck forever in it. I mean, she certainly, she marched on. She she wrote that big book. She, she until her health was so bad, she was doing things. She, she had that, uh, using her own words, she did have that. She really admired a relative of hers who during the crossing, getting to California from the Midwest, this young woman had, as uh, not rarely happened, had her baby die. And she had not told anybody till they got to a town. She'd held the baby in a, in a shawl because she wanted her baby to be buried in a town where there could be, she could find him. She'd know where he was. And she mm. did that. And then she got back on the wagon train and she went, you know, and she admired that. And I always thought, oh, Joan is never going to have that strength. Someday if her husband dies, she'll never. She's so connected. No, she had that strength. But yeah, she would not. She wouldn't have wanted to recover in a way. Mm. Oh, that's that's heavy. But it, it it also kind of um it no, but it it, it connects to some of the stuff that we've been talking about today. Um, should we? Uh, that might be a good place to end. Um, I think so yeah. it's a very depressing place to end. But, depressing, but but, but <laughs> it's a it's a sad it's a in memoriam kind of piece. So yeah, yeah. Caitlin, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your insights on um, Vivian's you. life and work. I was so happy when I heard we were going to have this conversation. Same, same. Yeah. Um, so you can read more from Caitlin um, at theatlantic.com and in our June print issue. If you enjoyed this conversation and want more of The Atlantic, you can support our journalism by becoming a subscriber. Um, you can uh, also visit our website for more information on how to do that. And it's also where you can sign up for the Books Briefing, which is our weekly free newsletter about books. Um, and then please join us on June 28th for the next Scientific Revolution, which is a discussion with scientists, doctors, futurists, and ethicists about the next frontier in scientific research. Um, thanks so much again for joining us today. Thanks, Jane.